So, ladies, I'm just, I'm really happy, honored to be here with you tonight. And I have to say, um, I, I just want to commend you for showing up to a conference. We're going to be talking about suffering. And you know what? We don't like to talk about suffering, do we? Does anybody like to talk about suffering? You know what? But here's the thing, right? We all have suffered in some way or other, right? And Kaylin, thank you for sharing with us your, your story. You're just in the beginning stages, right? It's deep waters. So some of us have suffered. Some of us are suffering right now. And ladies, I'm so sorry, but we're all going to suffer, right? Because we know that we've been promised in this world we're going to have trouble, trials of every kind, and so here we are, right? It's the truth. So I'm just, I'm coming to you tonight not as one who has it all figured out, not at all, but I am coming to you as a sister in Christ who is just walking the same road, right? Walking with you. So I have to ask, I just have to ask to start with, how many of you actually want to suffer? <laughs> we have some counselors in the house. If you answer yes to that, I think you should get, get with them, right? <laughs> and talk to them. So I'm assuming that if we were on the road, right, we're walking down the road, and to the right, it says the way of suffering, and to the left, it says the way of comfort, I'm feeling like all of us would go on the way of comfort, right? I know I would. I would lead the way, okay, because that's where I want to go. I want to go on the, on the way of comfort, not the way of suffering. But the truth is, God's Word says that we're going we're gonna to suffer. And even though we don't want to talk about it, we really should, right? Because God's word actually has a lot to say to us about suffering. And tonight, you guys, we only have a limited amount of time, and I feel like this is like such a huge, huge topic. So I just want to tackle two questions, and I know that we're not going to even be able to answer those thoroughly, but we'll just do the best we can to get a start, all right? But I want to talk about why do we suffer and then the how. How do we suffer? And so I think the common answers that we always hear about why do we suffer, right? We suffer because we live in a sin-fallen world. The sin's infected. The world is infected with sin. And we know it didn't start off that way. Genesis 1 tells us that God created everything and it was all good. But Adam sinned. And ever since, we've all lived in a sin-fallen world. We also suffer because of the sin of other people. Right? Sin has a ripple effect. We don't sin in isolation. And so when those around us are struggling with sin, it affects us. Right? Hebrews tells us that all of creation is groaning. And we feel it, don't we? Sometimes we suffer just because of our own sin. Right? Our poor choices our rebellion, our selfishness. So those are the common reasons that we think of why we suffer. And if that's all I had to offer you about the why, we would walk out of here tonight really discouraged, really desperate, hopeless, right? But I am I'm praying, I'm hoping that when, when we leave, um, that we will have some sense of hope and some sense of where our, our joy can be found. So, why else then? Why else do we suffer? Kaylin read for us our passage tonight. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to just turn to Romans 5. 
because we're going to be referring to it all night. We read through it already. And I think as we read through it, we actually saw some other reasons of why we suffer. Ladies, there's so much hope for us in this passage. There's good news for us in this passage of why do we even suffer? And you know what? Our suffering comes in so many forms, right? It's the little annoyances. It's like the drip, drip, drip of the faucet, and it's just annoying. And we actually find ourselves in that. It's painful, right, to some degree. Or there's also suffering that comes in the form of when our life implodes and everything in between. I could name a bunch of things, but I think you can fill in the blank, right? What it is that is the source or cause of your suffering. But what we see here in this text is so encouraging because it says in verse 3, More than that, our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. You guys, our suffering is so valuable, and it has so much benefit for us. So much. Suffering produces endurance, which produces character, which in turn produces hope. That endurance is the ability to not give up, to keep on, to bear up underneath it. You know what? Suffering actually gives us the opportunity to exercise our faith muscle. Just like real physical exercise, if we never do it, we're not going to get stronger, are we? We're going to dwindle, actually. We're going to get weaker. But when we exercise physically, we get stronger and we can endure more, right? And in suffering, it's the opportunity for us to exercise that faith so that we can bear up under it, so that we can endure. The next thing it says is that that then produces character, and that character is the very character of Christ, Romans 8 tells us the same thing, that he, God causes all things to work out together for good. We like to stop there, right? Good. But then it goes on, and it tells us that's actually going to be conforming us to the image of his son. There's good in that. Have you ever seen a man or a woman, and you, you watch their life, and you think, man, I see Jesus in them. I guarantee you they've walked through suffering. They've had the opportunity to learn how to endure, and God has formed Christ in them and in their character. I love the widows at our church. I love the opportunity to have them over to my home, and every chance I get, I tell them, you are the heroes of the faith. I see their lives, and I see they've been through the fire, and they've come out the other end, and they are declaring the goodness of God, and they're declaring his faithfulness. And I hear them as they pray, and they're thanking the Lord for his goodness to them, and I see their loving kindness toward each other. And I see, man, they've suffered, but God has worked out in their life. So much good. I see the character of Christ in them. And then also, it goes on to say that character produces hope. 
Character produces hope. It's not just wishful thinking. It's a confident expectation of a guaranteed result. We don't just go around wishful thinking, right? We hope that this is going to turn out all right. We hope that God keeps his promises. We, we wish he will. We hope he will. No, we are confident, right? And God is producing that in us, that confidence in him. The NIV goes on to say that it doesn't disappoint. You guys, everything else in life is going to disappoint us. Family, they're going to disappoint us sometimes. Friends, no matter how awesome they are, they're going to disappoint us sometimes. What we feel like might be a safe bank account, it's going to disappoint us sometimes, right? Our health is going to disappoint us sometimes, but Jesus never will. Our confidence in him, our hope in him is secure. So the why. Why do we suffer? Because there is value in it for us. There is benefit to us from it. Our suffering is actually a tool in God's hands for our benefit so that these very things can be produced in us. But then we, we have to ask, then how? How do we suffer? How do we suffer well? Because we can suffer, and we can actually suffer in our suffering if we don't suffer well. Does that make sense? Yeah? I think the answer And again, I am not going to begin to cover the gamut of this, but I think we can find some great hope for us in this passage about how do we actually suffer well. We see right in the middle of these five verses, verse 3, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. And as you read through that, It almost seems like that phrase is out of place because in those five verses, you go back to the very beginning. In verse 1, it says, therefore, what's it there for, right? We always ask that question. It's because those first four chapters of Romans are talking about our desperate need for God's rescue, right? We need his rescue. We are sinful, And we need him to rescue us. And then he says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, since we have been declared righteous by God, then he goes on. And there's four benefits to our justification in these five verses that we're going to take a look at. And they are going to help us in our how we suffer. Because if we will... Be diligent to remember these things and go back to them in our suffering. They will be of great hope and encouragement to us, and they will help us in our suffering. So the very first benefit that we see in this passage, the benefit of our justification, the benefit that we have actually been declared righteous now, is that we have Peace with God. Verse 1, peace with God. It doesn't say the peace of God. We do have the peace of God. But in this particular passage, it says that we have peace with God. No longer do we have to live under the fear of the judgment of God or the wrath of God. And no amount of suffering is going to change that. We always, if we know Christ and have put our faith in him, we do not have to live in fear. We have peace with God. We are absolutely secure. 
Then you go on and it says, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We've obtained access into our faith. We've obtained access into the presence of our holy God. We have access to him. He's given us a free pass into his presence. And then it goes on and it says that we have hope in God. We have eternity with him to look forward to. We have a time when we will have no more tears and no more sorrow and no more pain. We can be confident of that. That is our great hope. Paul says that this suffering is light and momentary compared to our great hope of eternity with him. And I got to tell you the truth. There have been times when I have thought, Lord, if this is light and momentary, my mind can't comprehend what eternity looks like. And I don't think you can, right? Because a lot of times our suffering doesn't seem, from this perspective, light and momentary. It doesn't feel that way. And God is saying, lift your heads. I have great hope for you. This is light and momentary. The fourth benefit that we see in verse 5 is that because of God, God's great love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You guys, we are deeply loved by God. Actually, God's love initiated our justification. God's love sees us through our sanctification, which is part of the purpose of our suffering. And then God's love is going to lead us into our glorification when we get to spend eternity with him. In our suffering, if we can go back to these truths, it's going to help us in the how we suffer we go back to these truths. And ladies, in our times of suffering, we need to go back to this because we're going to have questions in our time of suffering. I know I've had questions in my times of suffering and pain. I've wondered such things as, is God even good? I've wondered that. I'm wondering, why would a good God let this happen? I've wondered, where is God anyway? Where is he in this? Does he even care what I'm going through? I've wondered, God, this is too hard. I can't. I can't do it. I wondered how any of this could possibly turn out for good. How could it? From my perspective, it didn't seem like it, there was any way. I've questioned God's plan in that. I, heard, I, heard, I talked with a, a dear sister at our church a few years ago. And she said to me, I just need to back up, man. If God gave this to me, then he must think I can handle it. I'm like, oh, honey, Diane, your daughter is dying of cancer. That is too much. You cannot handle it. God's not expecting you to, right? But we have these questions. The answer to these questions we can find in this text and throughout scripture. When we ask that question, where is God? Where is he? When we wonder, 
Is God even good? We can go back to one of those first benefits of our salvation. We actually have peace with God. Our holy God has made a way for us to spend eternity with him. And he did that through the suffering of his son and through his own suffering because he was separated from his son in that. He has already, at a high price to him, has accomplished the greatest good, our salvation, our eternity with him. He's actually already proven that he is good. When we wonder, where is God anyway? Does he even care? We can go back to the truth that we have access to God. We've given a free pass into his presence. I love what Psalm 116, 1 and 2 says. It says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. Did you catch it? God is inclining his ear to hear us. He is bending down in our times of hurt and pain. He is bending down to hear our cries. We have access to the Father. In fact, he is very near. He is very near. And ladies, I just want to encourage you. You do not have to wait until your prayers are pretty to go to the Father. You do not have to. You can ugly cry in front of the Father. And he is bending down to hear you. He cares that much about you. I love the example of David so many times that I, I just wanted to read what he says in the beginning of Psalm 13. I think it'll make us feel better about our ugly crying out to the Lord. And he says, How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I have cried out like that before. Lord, I am so frustrated. I'm so hurt. In our suffering, in our pain, in our confusion, when we can't see how God is going to work it out, we have access to him. We can cry out to him. When we have no words, Hebrews tells us that the Spirit actually takes our groanings and he takes them to the Father on our behalf. And I love how Psalm 13 ends then. He starts out with, how long are you going to hide your face from me? Are you going to forget me forever? And then he, see, he says, I will sing to the Lord. He has dealt bountifully with me. Because we are justified, we have access to the Father, and he is very near. What about when we're like, I am done? I, I've actually said that. I think I said that to Tara and Emily a month or so ago. I walk down the hall. There they are in, in the church hallway, and I'm like, done. I'm like, I am done. I can't do this anymore. I recall that. Mm -hmm. I recall that. Oh, man. <laughs> can't do this anymore. Or on the other side of the coin, like my friend Diane, like thinking, man, I just got to try harder, right? No. Either side of those coins, ladies, we still can go to the Father and we can find 
great hope. And the very fact that we have hope as a benefit of our salvation and our justification is huge for us in those moments because we will remember that our eternity is secure and it does not depend on us, right? And in the same way, our ability to get through our times of suffering does not depend on us. So when I finally get to the place where I'm like, I can't do it anymore, that's actually a good place to be, right? And then we're like, I'm I'm done, Lord. You're going to see me through. He will be faithful, right? He will see us through. Hebrews 4.14 reminds us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It doesn't say there that we have a high priest who's on the sidelines cheering us on saying, come on now, buck up, you can do it, I'm cheering for you. No, he's saying, I sympathize, I understand, I understand, and I have mercy for you, I have grace for you, I have help for you in your time of need. It's in our weakness, right, that he's strong, and his strength is sufficient for us. Sometimes we ask the question, we wonder, maybe in our own suffering or as we see other people suffer, and we, we wonder, um, is this the result of my, my sin? Is that why God's treating me this way? Sometimes suffering is God's discipline, his loving discipline in our lives, right? To train us and correct us, and grow us up. And we should examine our hearts, but we should not assume that all our suffering is a result of our our sin. The gospel, our means of justification, actually declares the opposite. 1 Peter 2 tells us that He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. He's already suffered for our sins. We couldn't pay that price. Jesus already has. And you know what? It's our human nature to um, correlate bad behavior with bad circumstances. It's also our human nature to correlate good behavior with blessings, right? But Jesus actually debunked that theory in John. In John chapter 9, when the the man is born blind, right? And the disciples come to Jesus and say, what's the problem? Were, Were his parents sinning? Was he sinning? And Jesus says, no, this actually happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. It was actually for God's glory. God had a higher purpose for the suffering, and the same is true in our life. We should definitely examine our hearts, right? But we should also consider that this suffering is for God's glory and my good and my benefit and my growth. We also wonder, how could any of this possibly turn out for good? I've certainly wondered that more than once. You know what? I think Mary and the disciples wondered that on Friday night after Jesus died, right, and was buried. How could any of this turn out for good? But Jesus conquered death. 
and he provided new life for them and for us. He brought good out of the worst, right? Surely, he can bring good out of the very difficult circumstances of our lives that cause us to suffer, even when we can't see it. He forces every trial to do good unto us. That's who our God is. I'm praying that we'll be quick to remember the benefits of our justification, that we have peace with God, we have access to God, we're secure in our hope in God, and we rest in God's love. But there's more. Look at verse 2. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace, grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and the beauty of his character. That's what we rejoice in. We rejoice in the beauty of his character. We worship him when all we want to do is sit and wallow. We worship. When we are weary and tired, we worship. When we don't understand, we worship. When we're hurting and life is heavy and it's hard, we worship. That's what we do. We worship our way through our suffering. And ladies, that's not going to come naturally. And you can't wait until you're in your time of suffering when it's that annoying drip or when life explodes. You can't wait until then. You have to determine that you're going to make worship a habit and a way of life. You can read through the Psalms and use the words that David used for worship. As you're reading God's word, you can look for God's character, and when you see it, you can stop and worship him for it and thank him for it. You can review God's names and his character and his attributes, and you can worship. And I, on your table, and you can grab it later, but there's a little handout there for you, and it's a little Papers put together. One is his at, pages, his attributes. One in his names, and one, one is his character. I have I've had that resource. I don't even know how many years. Probably twenty, maybe longer. And I have gone through it over and over and over again. And it's the crazy thing that when you go and you look and you see who God is. It puts such perspective on whatever the trouble and the struggle is, whatever the suffering is. You look to see who God is, and it gives you a whole new perspective. You can listen to worship music all the time. That helps, too. A little over, well, a little over two years ago, um, <clears throat> my, my son and his daughter were expecting their fourth child. And she went in for her 20-week ul ultrasound, and she found out that their baby girl, our little granddaughter, um, she was probably going to make it to term. But she most likely wasn't going to live through delivery. And if she did, she would probably only live a couple hours. Well, those, four, those couple hours actually turned into four days that we got to love and hold our baby girl. I remember Christmas two years ago. Our whole family was sitting around. Chris is pregnant, very pregnant. 
And she's, she tells us, you know what? We, decide, we, we decided on a name for, for our baby. And we're all like, oh, you know what? And, and she explained to us that the only time she had felt peace was when she was at church and they were, they were singing a song and, this, and the song had the word hallelujah in it. So she, she explained to us, we're going to name our baby girl Hallelujah. And let me tell you, <laughs> oh man, you know that Hallelujah means God be praised, right? God be praised. Since that day when she said that, all of us, we started singing on repeat every Hallelujah song we had ever heard, and then we heard some new ones, and we started singing those too. We sang them over and over again. Phrases like, I raise a hallelujah. It's a broken hallelujah, right? We sing hallelujah. The lamb has overcome. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Hallelujah, even here. We sang, oh, death, where is your sting? The resurrected king has resurrected me forever. We will sing hallelujah. You guys, as only God could orchestrate and would have it, we're early in the morning. We're all sitting in Brian and Chris's living room. Baby hallelujah had passed away, and we were singing, Oh, death, where is your sting? The resurrected king has resurrected me. And we were singing that when the mortician, this sweet old man, walked in and took our baby hallelujah. Forever we will sing hallelujah. And I, it's been... Next month, we'll, um, we'll gather together and we'll celebrate two years ago when Hallelujah was born. But I have wondered so many times in these last two years how different it would have been if God hadn't put on Carissa's heart to name our baby <laughs> Hallelujah. Because we can worship through our suffering. It's our way through, ladies. It's our way through. Worship is that avenue for us. You know, 2 um, Corinthians 4, eight says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. God's not wasting our suffering, ladies. He is not wasting it. I I can attest that we certainly, all of us, right, we've been afflicted. Mm -hmm. We've been perplexed. More than once, we've been perplexed. We've been persecuted. We've been struck down, for sure, right? But... Because we are his, because we have peace with God, because we have access to him, because we have hope that is confident in him, because we are loved by him, we're not crushed. We're not in despair. We're not forsaken. We are not destroyed. And we can Because of who God is, how 
beautiful he is, we can worship our way through it. And we can remember the benefits of our salvation that are ours. And then we can trust him that he is going to build our endurance. He is going to form us to the image of his son. And he is going to give us great hope. Let's pray. Father, I pray for these women in this room. Lord, I you know some of them are walking through a season when it seems like all is well. Thank you for those times, Lord. I you know that some of them are in a season where it's the constant drip and it's annoying and it's hard and it's, it makes you tired, Lord. Lord, I know that there's some women in this room whose life um, feels like it's just imploded, and it is hard. They don't see a way out. Lord, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that we have access to you. Thank you that you will see us through. God, we want to be found having our eyes lifted up and looking at you and trusting you in the middle of it all. Lord, would you comfort these women in their places of suffering? God, would you give them strength to endure? Would you conform them to an enemy, Lord, to the image of your Son? And God, would you give us great hope, confidence in you, help us to rejoice in you, and to worship you because you are worthy. We pray these things in your Son's precious name.